My name is John Benet Ramsey, and I'm five and a half. And, and that's backwards. <laughs> yeah, how do you prove you're not guilty? Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. This is episode 19, the penultimate episode in the Khan's Order series. We pick up the narrative about middle of page 80, and this is a quoting from the Khan's Order, quote, Yet, other than a contention that Mrs. Ramsey authorized the ransom note, the circumstantial evidence proffered in support of plaintiff's claim is based almost exclusively on the theories espoused by former detective Steve Thomas in his book. Plaintiff does offer two arguments not involving the issue of the identity of the murderer in support of, finding of, in support of a finding of malice. First, plaintiff argues that Mrs. Ramsey's admission that she destroyed her handwritten book notes is strong evidence of malice. Did you know that? Did you know that Patsy Ramsey, in preparing to write the book, The Death of Innocence, actually destroyed her handwritten notes? Quite interesting, isn't it? The Khan's order goes on to refer to certain case law, citing Brown and Williamson uh, Tobacco Corp versus Jacobson, stating that intentional destruction of evidence is strong evidence of malice. The record, however, establishes that Mrs. Ramsey threw away her handwritten book notes as she was writing the book and did not destroy any documents once the suit was filed. Pre-litigation destruction of documents does not indicate actual malice. So I find that quite an interesting, if slightly slippery, argument. I've got to tell you, I've written over 100 books and... I've got, um, I probably don't write um, any books by hand, but I've certainly got a lot of handwritten notes all over the place. And I probably got copies of stacks of books lying all over the place. It just um, doesn't make any sense to destroy um, uh, written material. Um, And, um, you know, I've already written, as I say, 100 books. If I'd written one book, I think I would treasure and I would protect the documentation because because it's so um, special and because so much effort goes into that, right? Another interesting argument that is at the bottom of page 80 is the plaintiff contending that Mr. Ramsey's admission that he avoided investigating any of the facts concerning Forensic evidence is also evidence of malice. And then it goes on to say, Mr. Ramsey did state that he had seen evidence concerning the plaintiff's possible association with the case and received summaries of the Boulder Authority's handwriting evidence, which concluded that Mrs. Ramsey probably did not write the ransom note. It's quite an interesting argument to say, well, you know, why didn't Mr. Ramsey investigate forensic evidence well it looks like he did investigate forensic evidence against suspects he also asserts that he had no reason to doubt any of this information as a matter of law he's entitled to rely on this information and then it refers to some additional case law something else just to refer to here top of page 81 she says further Um, Detective Smith's summary testimony concerning the investigation is based on evidence. Detective Thomas's theories appear to lack substantial evidentiary support. Indeed, while Detective Smith is an experienced and respected homicide detective, Detective Thomas had no investigative experience concerning homicide cases prior to this case. And that state that that point seems to come out of Smith's deposition that he's a respected detective, but Detective Thomas had no investigative experience concerning homicide cases. In short, the plaintiff's evidence that the defendants killed their daughter and covered up their crime is based on little more than the fact that defendants were present in the house during the murder. I must say it's hard not to laugh at that statement. Let me read it again. In short, the plaintiff's evidence that the defendants killed their daughter and covered up their crime is based on little more than the fact that the defendants were present in the house during the murder. 
um, you know, just turning that whole statement around, you know, we know for a fact who was in the house when John Bonet died. We don't know who wasn't in the house, or let me put it another way, we don't know who this intruder person was. We know for a fact that the Ramses were there, but we don't know who wasn't there or who was supposedly there. And so it's amazing how the Khan's order seems to invert certain things, doesn't it? It's, it's quite amazing how the narrative at the end becomes kind of an inversion of what one would perhaps expect. Now we go to page 82. It refers to the court agreeing with plaintiff that if plaintiff adduced clear and convincing evidence from which a reasonable jury could infer that Mrs. Ramsey wrote the ransom note, this evidence would then be sufficient to create a jury issue as to whether Mrs. Ramsey killed her child. In other words, if Mrs. Ramsey wrote the ransom note, this court could conclude, as could a reasonable jury, that she was involved in the murder of her child. The question then is whether the plaintiff has proffered such clear and convincing evidence. This court has earlier ruled that the plaintiff's expert, Mr. Epstein, is qualified to compare Mrs. Ramsey's handwriting with that contained in the ransom note for the purposes of pointing out similarities in the two. The court, however, has concluded that Epstein cannot properly testify that he is certain that Mrs. Ramsey was the author of the note. So you have this weird scenario where they say, Okay, well, we'll accept that if you say that Patsy was the author of the ransom note, then you've got a very strong case that Patsy was involved in the death of her daughter. Then the prosecution, um, the plaintiff, have an e has an expert come forward, and the expert says Mrs. Ramsey definitely wrote the ha the Mrs. Ramsey definitely wrote the ransom note. Her handwriting is definitely a match. Then the court responds. Well, you you are too sure of your case, and you didn't look, you didn't examine the actual ransom note. <laughs> it's uh, it's pretty crazy. Anyway, let's just go back to uh, the Khan's order. She she writes for the purposes of assessing whether the plaintiff has met its burden of proof. The court will analyze the evidence, assuming that Epstein could testify as to his proffered conclusion as well as assuming that he could testify only as to similarities between both the ransom note and Mrs. Ramsey's known handwriting samples. Now, of course, there was difficulty with that as well, getting hold of Patsy's actual handwriting samples, and that, that's mentioned here, that they, why did Patsy destroy, or what happened to the written um, uh, notes that were part of the book? What happened to that? Anyway, we now go to page 83. Analysis of the two theories, consideration of Epstein's testimony. Uh, apparently, he said there were similarities between Mrs. Ramsey's handwriting and the ransom note. As, disc as discussed above, much of the physical evidence is consistent, is consistent with an inference that an intruder came into the Ramsey home and murdered their child. Okay. Specifically, there was a broken window in the basement and the window well for that window showed signs that someone may have entered the house through it. Indeed, some of the foliage and debris, we've been through this, but from that window well was found in the room where John Bonnet's body was found. Further, the evidence of the stun gun, blah, 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 stun gun, blah, blah, blah. Conversely, the use of the stun gun, blah, blah, blah. Mrs. Ramsey, and then something about Mrs. Ramsey accidentally hit her daughter's head on the bathtub or bathroom floor. Presence of a bag, other physical evidence is consistent with a theory that an intruder was in the home. Page 84 talks about DNA evidence. Um, I think we've been through some of this before. Page 85. Plaintiff argues that the ransom note provides this necessary proof. At first blush, and even without an appraisal of the handwriting, the ransom note seems to support plaintiff's argument that the kidnapping was a hoax. Oh, wow! Well, so the, she does seem to have seen the light in this area that the ransom note could be bogus, set up by someone in the house. It is an extremely long and detailed note over three pages. Well, now it looks like we're getting somewhere. Moreover, an examination of the notepad 
on which the note was written indicates that the writer had attempted some earlier drafts of the note. In addition, the writer had apparently not even brought his own materials, but instead had used a notepad and felt marker from the Ramsey's home. These facts suggest that the killer had not come prepared with a ransom note already written, as one would expect a di diligent kidnapper to do. Further, one does not assume that an intruder intent on beating a hasty retreat would take the time to practice writing a note or to write a long detailed note. These assumptions then might suggest that someone in the house contrived the note. Wow, it looks like we're getting somewhere, except... Defendants have argued, however, that it is just as plausible that the killer had been hiding away in the home for many hours, waiting for the household to go to sleep before he sprung into action. That waiting time would have allowed him the leisure to write a note. Further, the length of time that it took to practice and write the note could also conceivably undermine a notion that Mrs. Ramsey wrote it. Under the plaintiff scenario, now on page 86, Mrs. Ramsey was working quickly to create a staged crime scene before her husband and son awoke. Given the, those time constraints and presumably a desire to provide as little handwriting as possible for purposes of future analysis, she arguably would not have written such a long note. Accordingly, the existence of this particular long ransom note does not necessarily favor as the killer, either an intruder or Mrs. Ramsey. <sighs> That is pretty that is pretty crazy. So now you've got a argument that the long ransom note doesn't favor the, the intruder or Mrs. Ramsey. It goes on to say, thus the only conceivable piece of evidence by which plaintiff can hope to carry his burden of proof is evidence that indicates that Mrs. Ramsey actually wrote the note. Factoring into the analysis the testimony of Mr. Epstein that there are similarities between Mrs. Ramsey's handwriting and the ransom note does not, however, enable plaintiff to meet that burden. The fact that there may be similarities between the two hardly constitutes persuasive evidence that Mrs. Ramsey actually wrote the note. Without that proof, plaintiff cannot show that Mr. Rams Mrs. Ramsey was the killer. So what she's saying here effectively is, you know what, maybe there's similarities between um, Patsy Ramsey's handwriting and the ransom note, so what? So what? Maybe there's similarities, maybe there's some here, so what? It hardly constitutes persuasive evidence. Oh. Then it goes on. Consideration of Epstein's testimony that he was absolutely certain that Mrs. Ramsey wrote the ransom note. So this is quite interesting. So first they say, well, you know, if there's similarities, so what? So then you might think, well, what they're looking for is some certainty. How can you be certain that there's similarities, then you say, I th I'm 100% certain. How can you be 100% certain if you didn't examine the actual ransom note? The court had, has earlier indicated its conclusion that there is insufficient reliability to Mr. Epstein's methodology to permit him to state his conclusion that Mrs. Ra Ramsey wrote the ransom note. As noted, Epstein opined that he is 100% certain, and that's a quote, also the title slide of this episode that Patsy Ramsey wrote the ransom note and that the quote is absolutely no doubt that she's the author. Now we're on page 87. The court believes its conclusion on admissibility of this evidence to be correct. Further, as the identity of the writer is virtually the only evidence that plaintiff can offer to shoulder its burden, then the question of the identity of the writer is synonymous with the underlying question in this litigation. Did Mrs. Ramsey kill her child? Nevertheless, even if the court were to permit Epstein to testify as to the above conclusion, the court does not believe his testimony would provide the clear and convincing evidence necessary for a reasonable finder of fact to conclude that Mrs. Ramsey wrote the note. That's effectively just saying that although um, Epstein was saying clearly and unambiguously I definitively, definitely, absolutely believe that Patsy Ramsey wrote the ransom note. The court saying, well, I don't think that's clear and convincing evidence. So it, she goes on to say, as stated before, clear and convincing evidence requires a clear conviction without hesitancy of the truth. The parties have agreed that handwriting analysis is at best an inexact and subjective tool used to provide probative but not clear and convincing evidence of a questioned document's author. 
Nonetheless, the court will assume that there could be cases where the handwriting in question is either so obviously not the handwriting of a particular individual or so close a match to that person's penmanship that a finder of fact could comfortably rely on the handwriting alone to reach a particular conclusion. Indeed, well before the days of forensic handwriting experts, courts have allowed lay witnesses to testify that they recognize the handwriting of particular documents as the handwriting of someone with whose penmanship they were familiar. Once again, it feels like, wow, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. It looks like there might be a little light of revelation here. So, for example, did the housekeeper recognize the handwriting as Patsy's? Did the housekeeper recognize some of the statements in the handwriting? Right. Yeah. So you you could have a lay person just saying, "Yes, that that did look to me a bit like Patsy's handwriting." So it looks like we're getting somewhere. But then she says, "That said, while there may be cases in which handwriting examination alone can be dispositive, this case is not one of that group." Oh, so in a case where the Ram- Ramsey ransom note is absolutely idiosyncratic. This isn't a case where handwriting matters. Oh, okay. Here, as noted, several factors necessarily reduce the weight a reasonable juror could give to Epstein's conclusion. Okay, I'm not sure if you heard in the background there that was my dog vomiting. I'm not sure if he was vomiting because of what I was saying, if he could understand what I was saying. Um, To be honest, you know, you might think that I'm making light of this. It's something that... It's difficult for it not to turn your stomach because it just seems to be so impossible. It just doesn't seem to be logical or sound. And um, anyway, so I do actually attend to my dog. I do take him outside and I think he's got a bit of an upset stomach. Anyway, going back to the ransom note and the references to it in the Khan's order, she says... First, Epstein did not consult the original ransom note nor obtain original exemplars from Mrs. Ramsey. So her criticism that he can't be certain about whether Patsy wrote it is, well, he didn't look at the original ransom note and secondly, he didn't um, get actual original exemplars from Patsy Ramsey, which is almost kind of a negative argument. It's almost as to say, well, if you did have the original well, then, then what could you say, right? So it's kind of arguing procedure and protocol. It's not really arguing the evidence. And she says this is what a reasonable juror would think about Epstein's conclusion. Anyway, secondly, as noted by defendants, Epstein deviated from the very method- methodology that he has previously asserted was necessary to make a reasoned judgment. Most significant to the court in its determination that Epstein's conclusion cannot carry the the day for the plaintiff is the unanimity of opinion among six other experts that Mrs. Ramsey cannot be determined to have been the writer of the note. So it's like I said earlier on is you've got two experts, which is then whittled down to one, and then it becomes kind of a mathematical equation. You know, when you are in um, junior school, when you first learn mathematics and you see the sign six bigger than one, right? Number six bigger than one. Oh, so if there's six experts that say something and one ex or two experts say something, oh no, now it's one expert. Oh, so that now means that. So if you play it the other way around and you could have got, say, seven experts for the prosecution, Seven is bigger than one. Seven is bigger than six. Oh, okay, so that means that um, it must mean that the prosecution are right. Oh, okay, well, we'll get another expert. Eight is bigger than seven. If the law worked like that, I mean, it, it would be a circus. But it does seem like this is how the um, the decision has been reached, is through this kind of oversimplified mathematics Right. And that is why I think it does deserve to be um, mocked in some way. It does deserve a tone that is sort of disbelieving and doubtful. Right. 
she goes on to say the Boulder Police Department and District Attorney's Office had consulted six other handwriting experts, all of whom reviewed the original ransom note and exemplars. Now, if I was a judge, I would basically say, look, this is an unfair scenario. You can't have six people have access to the original ransom note, but in terms of the prosecution, none of them have access to it. And so you're going to give the benefit of the doubt to those who had access what about making sure that the other side have access anyway she goes on to say none of these six experts were able to identify mrs ramsey as the author of the ransom note so voila instead their consensus was that she probably did not write the ransom note page 89 given the contrary opinion of six other experts whose ability to examine the documents was necessarily superior to epstein's and given Epstein's failure to explain the methodology by which he can make absolute pronouncements concerning the authorship of a document, this court does not believe that a reasonable jury could conclude that Mrs. Ramsey was the author of the ransom note solely on the basis of Epstein's professed opinion to that effect. And what is quite interesting is if you think about the grand jury, what do you think that they decided with regard to the ransom note? We don't know the answer. We don't know what they thought. We don't know what they said. We don't know what was testified, but we do know what they eventually voted on. And what do you think that that implies about what they thought about who wrote the ransom note? Because it's either a case that an intruder wrote the ransom note or one of the Ramses wrote the ransom notes, one or the other. So what do you think the grand jury, another court essentially another jury what do you think that they thought and so th she says this court does not believe that a reasonable jury could conclude that mrs ramsey was the author of the ransom note what do you think do you think that a reasonable jury could conclude that mrs ramsey was the author of the ransom note and you know there were other handwriting experts i think that testified in the grand jury investigation, and I could be wrong, but wasn't one of them Chet Yubowski? And what did Chet Yubowski say about the authorship of the ransom note? She goes on to say, in reaching this conclusion, the court is aware that it is not permitted to make credibility judgments in ruling on summary judgment motions. For example, were there six eyewitnesses on one side of a question and one eyewitness on the other side, the court would not take from a jury the factual question which these witnesses were testifying. Oh, so she's now just addressed the bigger than issue, but anyway, with regard to Epstein's testimony, however, the court is not attempting to assess credibility. Oh, not. Mr. Epstein may sincerely believe that Mrs. Ramsey wrote the note and the jury may well credit his sincerity. Nevertheless, no matter how earnest Epstein may be, the fact remains that he has not explained his basis for reaching absolute certainty, blah, 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 in his conclusion and accordingly the weight and impact of his testimony would necessarily be less than the weight of the contrary testimony of six other experts. So she almost seems to be saying... You know, I'm sure he means well, and we, we don't want to criticize him and nothing against you, but we, we, we're just not going to uh, give you any weight. And, and whatever you say, we're not going to really regard it, right? So she goes on to say, the court's judgment on this matter is the same whether these other six experts were as vague concerning their methodology as was Epstein, or whether they, in fact, gave solid explanations. So... You know, you say all of that and, and what the six experts say is it probably wasn't Patsy Ramsey. Does that sound very convincing either? It probably wasn't Patsy Ramsey. And the crazy part is you have one scenario that's saying, well, we want to prove that it's this one individual's writing. And the other group not saying, well, it's very it's more likely to be this other individual you know, um, it's not X individual's handwriting, it's Y individual's handwriting. So what is going on here is one person saying it's definitely X individual's handwriting, another group saying it's definitely not X individual's handwriting. But that's totally different to saying it's not X individual's because it is Y, and they're not doing that. So you sort of identify an intruder, but you never um, 
you know, link his handwriting to the ransom note. And that's one of the craziest parts of the John Bonnet Ramsey case is everyone is trying to find DNA. Why don't you try and find the handwriting? Why don't you find someone with similar handwriting? And, you know, the, the easiest way to do it is you publish the, the ransom note all over the place and you say, do you recognize this person's handwriting? And you have the public phone in with tips and then you isolate it and check it that way. Right? Do you think anyone would have recognized Patsy's handwriting if someone had put an ad in the paper that way? Do you think someone would have recognized someone else's? Do you think if family members um, of the Ramses had recognized handwriting, do you think they would have come forward and said, wow, that, that does look like Patsy's handwriting? What do you think? On page 90, in sum, Plaintiff has failed to prove that Mrs. Ramsey wrote the ransom note and has thereby necessarily failed to prove that she murdered her daughter. Moreover, the weight of the evidence is more consistent with a theory that an intruder murdered John Bonnet than it is with a theory that Mrs. Ramsey did so. For that reason, plaintiff has failed to establish that when defendants wrote the book, they in fact entertained serious doubts as to the truth of the publication. And we're not going to take it further than that. In the next episode, the final episode, we'll deal with a very last section dealt in the Khan's order dealing with slander. I'll be doing a live uh, today. Well, it's today where I am um, at uh, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time uh, on Sunday. So if you've got any questions about the... Ramsey case or any comments please participate I'll also be talking about the Chris Watts case and the George Floyd case that's been playing out over the last couple of days so don't forget tomorrow will be the very last episode of the Khan's Order series and then I will probably also be doing a video on John Fernie. I meant to do it already but uh, time has kind of caught up with me but I'll be doing that um, very soon as well, so look out for that. If you've enjoyed this episode, if you've enjoyed this series, and you haven't subscribed yet to the channel, please make the effort. Move your cursor to the little blue icon on the right. Click the icon. Uh, please subscribe, like, share, leave a comment. Enjoy your Easter weekend, and I'll see you guys next time.